All right, well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming out tonight. Thank, uh, thankfully, also, the weather is held, although it looks like something's coming in. So I want to wish everybody Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays. My name is Patrice Horseman, and I am the supervisor, Coconino County Supervisor for District 1, which I am pleased to say includes Tuzion, Grand Canyon, Valley, all around, uh, down into the city of Flagstaff through downtown Flagstaff, a large district. I've been fortunate enough to come up to Tuzian a number of times, met with many of you, got to even sit in the new fire truck, which was quite, quite enjoyable, and really enjoyed the holiday tree lighting you had last week. Uh, uh, very impressive drone show, and I will be here for the 4th of July for the big drone show. Um, we're here tonight, Coconino County and the Flood Control District is here tonight to present to you on some very important issues and, and um, modeling and some studies that have been done here um, about the flood analysis for this area. Um, we also have taken a look at the August 22nd, 2023 Tuzion flash flood event. Some of us in fact did come up here uh, with the mayor and uh, your uh, fire uh, district and with met with a lot of you during that time and the county was here to help. Um, and we also want to share some information on long-term flood mitigation planning. We want to let you know what we are seeing, what our analysis is showing, and we look forward to hearing from you. And it is a long presentation, so we're going to ask you please make some notes on your questions and there'll be some time here at the end to answer these questions. Um, we have been able to share a lot of this information from the county uh, to your uh, town manager and also your mayor and town council. And before we go any further, I am going to ask uh, that the mayor come on, come on up and welcome you as well. So thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you so much, Patrice. Um, so it was a, a, a pretty pretty amazing event that um, went on here and without a lot of the folks that are here in this room it would have been a lot more difficult difficult for our council and for our town manager. I really want to thank Lucinda and Patrice so much. All Coconino County Emergency Services were just amazing and we at least we knew the people who to call and their responses were, were just amazing. I hope we don't have to go through anything like this again but it was just an amazing team. And I just so much want to thank Coconino County for all you guys did. You're an amazing partner. and We really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much. OK, so, so welcome, everybody. And um, we're going to get some little bit of ideas of, um, of what actually occurred and where we actually go from here. So who is next, Patrice? This is Andriana, our flood control okay. director. I think many of you. Many of you know Lucinda Andriani. She um, she appears, it seems like, whenever there's water, whenever there's flood, uh, whenever there's an emergency. Uh, we are so lucky that uh, to have someone that's such a seasoned veteran in Coconino County uh, working with the staff and working with our private partners uh, for the work that we have done um, and we are continuing to do, and especially for this project here in Tuzion. So I know that, Lucinda, you're going to introduce the staff, Flood Control District staff, and uh, Lucinda and the staff will take it away. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Supervisor and Mayor. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this evening. I'm Lucinda Andriani. I serve as the Deputy County Manager as well as the Flood Control District Administrator. And uh, we've got some other folks with us here tonight. Joe Loveridge with J.E. Fuller. Hydrology has done all of the modeling uh, that you're going to see tonight. And uh, Jay Fuller does all of our modeling for all of our post wildfire. Uh, Joe's done most of the post wildfire studies that we've done, one we did throughout the county and one uh, various individual areas, individual watersheds and broader areas uh, such as the Tucson area. Joe also serves as a district's engineer uh, in, in that capacity as well. And then also with us is John Carr. He's our community development uh, engineer and works with 
development planning and uh, is the engineer in the community development uh, department for us. And then way in the back, as you came in, you saw Casey Jenkins. And Casey is a program manager with the Flood Control District. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about more later about what uh, Casey's working on relative to Tucson as well. Then I'd also like to give an opportunity to introduce Deb Molay, who is the district ranger for, with the Forest Service. And Brandon, I already forgot, Brandon is brand new. I just forgot your, Kenny your, is a new deputy forest supervisor for the Kaibab National Forest. So uh, very, very much appreciate them being here. Uh, anything that, you know, going forward, we're going to need to work, obviously, really closely with, with the Forest Service. And fortunately, we've got a great relationship with Deb. We've been doing all the Bill Williams uh, Mountain. We've been leading the effort with the Forest Service to conduct forest restoration, uh, thinning projects, and uh, removing the dead and down on Bill Williams Mountain. Uh, and have had a pretty successful project there. We still have, what, about 400 acres or something left to finish up um, there, but uh, had a great relationship with their partnership. So this evening, uh, we're going to cover a number of topics here. I want to give a little bit of background because many people probably aren't familiar with the Flood Control District. They certainly know about the county. Um, but there's actually a separate entity that has the flood control authority within the county. The county actually has very limited authority. So um, we'll talk a little bit about its background and history just so you have that context and what, what are we primarily working on. Um, and then Joe's going to get into the watershed characteristics of the Co Coconino Wash, the, the watershed that flows through Tucson and the flood modeling. He's going to talk about the August 22nd event and the modeling he's done related to that. And, uh, and then we're going to talk about kind of how do we move forward? What does the process look like moving forward? So, um, so with that, this is the, the mission of the Flood Control District. And, um, you know, basically, it's, it's a, it's a, it has a very strong public safety function to it. Uh, and, um, Flood control districts were established in Arizona in the early 80s and um, really was an outcome of the, um, and a requirement by FEMA, the Federal um, Emergency Management Agency, uh, related to the National Flood Insurance Program. So we're basically the local, I'll say, better lack of a better term, branch or facilitator for the National Flood Insurance Program. And so those areas that are deemed special flood hazard areas, as is an area within Tucson uh, as a special flood hazard area designated by FEMA, then we have a role to manage, uh, we're, we're the, the, I'll say, the legal or authority within the county uh, that manages and regulates the activity within that floodplain. And that's true. We have other floodplains, special flood hazard areas throughout the county uh, in Munns Park, Kachina Village, Mountain Dell, Fort Valley, other areas as well. Some of the functions that we play, what's our role? This kind of covers some, some different elements. Um, Important from, from your perspective is conducting the flood assessment, the flood risk assessments. And then when, fu flood, when funding is available, which unfortunately has been very limited due to all the post-wildfire flooding that we've been dealing with since 2010, um, we implement, you know, the goal is to be able to implement flood mitigation projects. Um, unfortunately, we haven't, frankly, been very successful at that because we've been dealing with post-wildfire flooding. And as coming out of that whole effort, the county initiated a forest restoration initiative, of which our primary project to date has been Bill Williams Mountain. Uh, we're moving now to do a lot of work on the west side of the San Francisco Peaks, the watershed that flows, the Rio de Flag that th flows through Flagstaff. It's at very, very significant risk for wildfire, catastrophic wildfire and flooding as well. 
So we're trying to stop this cycle of wildfires and then post wildfire flooding so that we actually have some resources to put into uh, projects within our special flood hazard areas. So that's a whole effort underway as well. So again, a little bit of history. It was established, the authority, back in 19, uh, in the early 80s. The county took action in 1984 to actually establish. The Board of Supervisors sits as the Board of Directors for the Flood Control District, but it's an independent district. Just like when you think about there's the town of Tucson, and then you have the Tucson Sanitary District. They have their own Board of Directors, and they're an independent entity under the state as is the fire district, Tucson Fire District, has its own board of directors. So it's very kind of similar when you think about it in that way legally. We have the specific authority for, for you know, flood control. Some of the history, just a little bit of history here. Um, the areas that we manage, uh, just recently Page reverted its management back to the district. Uh, Tucson, Sedona, and Page, and the unincorporated areas of the county, we directly manage those floodplains uh, that are within those FEMA floodplains that are within those areas. Uh, within Flagstaff and Williams and Fredonia, we do not. They manage their own, and, and communities can elect to manage their own. Uh, the, the district is kind of the entity that will manage it if the local jurisdiction deems not to manage it. So, but they have to take a specific action to do that. So the initial rate, the, the rate that we can uh, charge for property taxes, it goes up to 50 cents for $100,000 valuation. And um, the initial rate was very low. It's currently at 50 cents because of the need both for forest restoration and the post wildfire flooding that we've experienced. Uh, again, a little bit more history here. We've only done two projects since we've had non-post wildfire related projects since we've had the district. One was in Kachina Village, uh, which uh, we did in concert with a, uh, a road project that was a road district project that was uh, done by the community there. Um, the district put in some funding relative to uh, drainage there, that is a FEMA floodplain there. And then when we had the Schultz fire, you may remember that north of Flagstaff on the east side of the peaks back in 2010, they raised the tax at that point as well to match the grant dollars that we were seeking to mitigate. This is a picture from in Doney Park where many, many of the homes in an area of Doney Park, we had upwards of four feet of water. And what has dominated the landscape for, for the district has been post-wildfire flooding since the Schultz fire in 2010. This gives you a little bit of rundown and the, the level of investment that we've had to make. We've been successful in bringing in a lot of federal funding, but a lot of, uh, you know, the vast majority of the tax base beyond a small amount of money that goes to help manage the, the actual NFIP program has gone into these projects and efforts worked with uh, uh, Nicole Branton on slide, <laughs> the slide fire in Oak Creek Canyon. She was the ranger down there at that time. But you can see most recently was the pipeline fire, uh, a reburn of the Schultz area as well as it burned more area. I've got, we've, we have watersheds there that are producing 26 times increase in the flood flows. You get a fire, you'll see anywhere from 10 to 15 to 20, 30, times the increase in flood flow so um very devastating fortunately we've secured about 90 million dollars in federal funding and we're working through uh, a very herculean task to get a lot of work done in that area trying to mitigate about 1500 homes stepping back a few years ago back in the um 2015 2016 2017 time frame we had a little break from the post wildfire flooding. We had completed the work in um, the Schultz flood area in 2015. And um, one of the things that, that the board was very clear on when they raised the tax was that they wanted 
to see more work done in the special flood hazard areas. So we moved forward with doing what are called initial engineering assessments, IEAs, uh, for the FEMA floodplains, uh, largely all within the unincorporated areas. And uh, uh, Tucson, I can't remember what year you actually had incorporated, but at that time, the council, uh, we offered to perform a hydrologic study and uh, do an initial set of, basically it's, it's preliminary conceptual look at what potential projects might be might be possible, um, but fairly low level initial study, you know. Um, but at that time, the council was pretty determined to to move the authority of the maintenance the administration of the floodplain to the council, and uh, they told us no. I mean, we sent formal letters and all of that, and they said no. We we don't want you to go ahead with this at this time. So we did not. We did the other areas. And we were able to complete a project out of that effort before we had another fire in 2019 in the Mountaindale area. Um, completed a floodplain uh, project there, very successful project. Then moving on, coming out of our experience with post wildfire flooding uh, in 2017, the board established a forest restoration initiative. And again, we've been uh, focused on doing two elements to that really. One is getting actual projects on the ground. Two is building the industry to support that. That's a big hurdle for restoration in this area in our broader county and, and much of Northern Arizona. There just isn't enough industry to consume the, the level of biomass um, that's produced off these projects, let alone the trees. So it's been a real challenge. We we have a, a flood con flood restoration, or excuse me, forest restoration director, Jay Smith, who's focused on that. Here's the project on Bill Williams Mountain. And starting tomorrow, uh, we're starting a whole discussion uh, with the board uh, about really the broader wildfire crisis in this county. And uh, going to be discussing with the board over the next four to five months what are the types of things we should be doing to leverage federal funding to reduce the risk of wildfire in this county. And I know Tucson has, has uh, been very responsive to that, the fire district here. Uh, we have applied for a grant to uh, update and do a much more current community wildfire protection plan. That's the first step to being able to potentially get project funding. And this is a funding source that was approved by Congress uh, that comes through the Forest Service. Um, so we want to be able to compete for those project dollars. We can't till we have the plan in place. So hopefully in February, we'll get the plan approved, then we'll get the plan done and then move through that process. But, um, and that's for doing work specifically within communities, it's called community wildfire defense, but also to secure their significant funding coming for restoration on national forest lands. And we want to continue to support that work. It's really critical. The most significant public safety threat in this county is catastrophic wildfire and post wildfire flooding. So that's a big goal of the county. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Joe. And um, Joe, again, is a professional engineer and certified flood, floodplain manager. He's got tremendous experience in this area. He's probably, I, I would say he's probably one of the top three experts in the country relative to post-wildfire flooding. And is there he and a couple other people at Jay Fuller are recognized for that across the Western US particularly. And, in other places in the country. We're very fortunate to have this resource right here in the county uh, working very closely with us. So um, we'll leave questions to the end, but when we get done actually with Joe's section, I think what we should probably open it up for some questions then too, just um, on the technical aspect of it. And then we'll come back and talk about, then I'll talk about uh, what are the next steps? Where do we go from here? 
and, and Charlie's gonna update what the town is doing as well. So, and I'm sorry, Charlie, I didn't introduce you earlier. So, I think everybody knows Charlie. We all know Charlie, so. All right, so again, thank you for being here. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Joe. Okay, I'm, I think You're I'm on. I'm mic'd up, can you guys hear me? Here, let's. He turns it off back there. You got it muted? Okay, yeah. All right. All right, well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Joe Loverich. I'm, uh, I'm out of Flagstaff. And I'm gonna walk through a couple things with you tonight. And we'll you know, kind of hopefully tell the full circle about what's going on in the watershed, maybe why, and begin to lay the stage for where you go forward from here. So a little bit of history that would be helpful is the effective so um, the effective FEMA maps, meaning if you look on the FEMA digital in, uh, rate insurance maps that show the flood risk in the area, those date back to the early 80s. So they're, they're pretty rough, almost hand-drawn maps, especially with some of these approximate areas that were drawn through Tucson. So that, that kind of sets the stage for information that's, that's there with the flood risk in Tucson. Then over the last 30 years, there's been a wide range of studies done from many different people um, looking at different aspects of the watershed, how it's, uh, you know, what people think the flood risk is based on the geomorphology, the how the channels look in the watershed based on some uh, anecdotal evidence. So there's, there's a lot of different things that have set a lot of opinions about what the flow rates through Tucson could be. There's not a lot of calibration data to go along with that true rainfall runoff calibration data. In fact, there's, there's really none. Um, so in the flood control district recently did a study um, that we did for the, for the flood control district that, that looked at, okay, based on, based on the best available data we have about soils in the region, about the watershed conditions, about, um, just how the watershed functions, here is what we think the, the true flood risk is through the, through the town. So that, that is currently being used as the best available data, and I'll get into that in a little bit here. Now August 22nd comes, it rains over the central part of the watershed, now we have some calibration data. And and so what I, what I want to do is, is help you understand how that happened and how we're using that as, as good data to be able to, to move forward with. So Coconino Wash, a little bit about the wash. We're right here in Tucson. This is the watershed uh, that goes all the way up to the rim of the canyon, comes back to Lockett Lake, Grandview Tower, whole cabin is back over in here. The, um, this includes the Long Jim tributary right here that comes in above the sanitary district. 10X is back here midway through the watershed. This watershed is pretty interesting because the whole topography of the region, generally speaking, is you have you know, the flow going away from the edge of the canyon, and then there's a ridge line that really defines where Coconino Wash is. There's a lot of interesting geologic features in the watershed, a lot of fault lines where you have these pretty canyonized drainages. They come through pinch points in that fault line and then they, they spread out a little bit more then. So it's, it's a pretty interesting watershed. About 60 square minor miles. There's ranges from juniper up to ponderosa pine and oak. Um, and generally speaking, it's, Hydraulic soil groups, meaning the type of soil in the watershed is this low infiltration um, type soil. So you're not looking at sands and cinders and things like that. You have very more loams and clays in, in the watershed that, that make the infiltration when the water falls on it quite low. And it's a relatively flat watershed. It's only a thousand feet, you know, from one end to the other, which is, which is relatively flat. So across the watershed, um, this right here is a representation of the different, the different soil mapping in the area. The soil mapping in the area is kind of a combination of data that's come from 
detailed mapping in the Grand Canyon National Park, which this is the line that you see with the park boundary. So there's detailed data there. There's some older Forest Service data that's not as detailed. Um, and there's some USGS geologic data. And, and that was used to basically help define what the soils are in the region, um, along with a lot of sampling points that we did kind of looking at um, both what's what's on the national forest, what's on the national park, what do the what what are the types of soil, how do they relate to each other? All this data is used to then to then go into our model. So this is right back here. I wanted to point about interesting elevation and topography. This whole ridge line right here is the ridge line between Coconino Wash, Rain Tank Wash that comes in south of the airport. Uh, all of these little fingers that, that go off of the edge of the wash are pretty interesting because because this is the main, this is 10x here. It's not a, not a great picture, but the wash flows through this way on towards Tucson. And these fingers are actually lower than the wash itself. So what happens, and it's, you know, people have known this for a long time. There's a stock tank down, down in these areas. Water can flow in and it can backfill these, these fingers. And once it finishes backfilling those fingers, it'll continue on its way down towards the town if it's a big enough storm. And so this is the one right off of 10X. And it's, if, you, if you walk from the 302 road down through the stock tank, it's a super gradual grade all the way up to the ridge line. So it is defining our watershed, but it's used as almost a natural storage. And on the August 22nd storm event, you could see evidence of water that was flowing into these areas over the top in the 302 road. And so, so you can kind of see how that, um, that operates in these, these cases. So it's just one of the interesting points of the watershed. As we move down in here towards Tucson, we are right here. The Coconino Wash flows in uh, right here um, on the back side of the Camper Village. There's a couple other tributaries. There's the South Tributary, which crosses the 302 road and comes in um, right kind of across from McDonald's. Then there's the North Tributary, flows in uh, through the north, north end of town, across the down towards uh, Coconino Wash. And then there's the Long Jim Tributary. That comes over across by the Forest Service office, just north of town, crosses the road, ties into Coconino Wash right at the sewer treatment plant. That's kind of your characteristics. So 100-year flood modeling, what, what is this? Okay, well, this is a, this is a, uh, a model. This is our um, calculations of how much runoff could be produced by a watershed um, when you have a statistical 1% chance rain event. That rain event has a certain depth tied to it that's defined by, um, by NOAA, and, and it's based on historic rainfall patterns and, and lots of data that goes into that that's produced nationwide. Now, the modeling I'm going to show you is a 2D, 2D grid-based hydrologic model. And I'm not going to too, go too much into the weeds, but what this is, is it takes your whole watershed and we divide it into these 20 foot by 20 foot grids. Simple enough. Each of those grids is assigned parameters. So you have an elevation, you have roughness, how smooth, how easy it is for the water to move across it. You have your soil parameters, you have things like the losses that you get from vegetation from, you know, rain getting caught in the trees before it hits the ground and, and other things like that. That water hits that grid and then the program solves for how much water moves off the grid, how much water comes onto the grid, and then all that accumulates based on the elevation in, in the main streams. So if we imagine it as a potted plant, very simplistic thing here, right? You, if you water this, eventually you'll see that water drip out the bottom. And, and that's based on how quick that soil infiltrates and how quick it goes through. If you start watering it at a rate faster than the soil infiltrates, it's going to overtop the basket. 
that's the runoff that we're talking about. So, so what, what this modeling does is it really takes into account all these physical parameters, physical properties of your watershed and solves for it. Just to give you a little bit, bit of a background on that. When we're talking rainfall, everybody, you know, everybody talks and this is a hundred year storm or this is a 10 year storm or it's all statistics. It's a statistical probability of getting, um, it's a 1% chance that that rainfall could happen. You can have a 100 year storm two days in a row. You could have a 100 year storm two weeks in a row. You know, it's, it's, it's statistical probability. Um, but what we do is we try to, this is, this is kind of our standard for FEMA floodplain mapping and identifying 100, this 100-year 100 flood risk. What in this watershed, in our watershed, this is our Coconino Wash watershed, we don't apply just one rainfall rate or one rainfall depth over the whole watershed. That rainfall is spatially varied based on elevation and, and how, um, uh, how NOAA calculates how that rainfall uh, has different depths over different elevations and different terrains. So like this, it's the Grand Canyon, the rainfall depths are a little bit less there for the 100 year event. They're a little bit higher in the very uh, east end of the Coconino Wash watershed. That variability is all accounted for in the 100 year modeling. The 100 year modeling also assumes that all tributaries are um, flowing into the town at the same time, or they are, the rainfall is happening over the whole watershed at the same time. So that's uh, a little back on. Very conservative. It, it is, yeah. Sure? It's a very conservative number, but it's but it's the base we use nationally for defining defining flood risk. Now, uh, what we're looking at here is this is Coconino Wash here. You can see in purple and various colors. You're looking at a depth ramp. So this these are the maximum depths at that grid that I told you about um, in the, uh, in the maximum, when, when that maximum flow rate is happening. So your blues are up to about a foot deep, greens are up to two, yellows up to three, orange up to four, and, and so on. So you end up with deeper, the, the colder the color, well, deeper the more purple it is, orange to purple. So this kind of represents how, um, how that water is flowing. You got tributaries coming into 10x, all that's flowing down, other tributaries feed in before you get to the town. That 100 year flow calculated at the town is about 10 and a half thousand CFS. That's a huge number. It's hard to understand that. It's a, it's a very large flow event. Um, the, the tributary inflow um, coming off the south and the north tributaries is about a thousand and same with Long Jim is about in that range. These all combine based on this modeling to, to a flow of 10 to 11,000 CFS through town. And you can see that covers a big area. Like it's, a, it's a really significant daunting looking flood risk. And I uh, um, and I think at this point, it's easy to shy away from this and really not want to see what, what the flood risk is because it's, it's, it's big. Um, these, are, these are big numbers and they aren't based off of calibration data. They're based off of what we can see in the watershed. So fast forward to uh, this year. What happened on August 22nd? So th on, on this map, you can see Tucson right here. The storm came from the south to the north, right across the midpoint of the watershed. This is all data provided by the National Weather Service. So this is their radar data as it, as it goes across. And then this is, a, this is the final radar data that they provided to us with the final rainfall depths at each at across the watershed. So these rainfall depths range up to about three, a little over three inches in the middle point of the watershed. And 
These storms happen between 12.30 and 2.45 with the heaviest storm between uh, 1.30 and 2.30, heaviest part of the storm. Now this is what's interesting, and this is something that we have to keep, keep in perspective, is um, in a very small portion of the watershed, it was a 100-year event. But over the grander big picture of the watershed, uh, well, that doesn't hold true. So if we look at this, this red bar here, right northeast of 10x, had, was about a 200-year event. That's 1% of the watershed. The, the orange, the dark orange here, that's your 100-year event rainfall. And it steps down from there to where you're at about, uh, what, 47% of the watershed had greater than a 25-year event on it, and it peters out from there. Um, so it kind of gives you a little perspective of the flow that was seen, and spatially how that storm covered the watershed. So what does this look like in Tucson? What we did was we took we took our model, and we replaced the the model rainfall with the actual rainfall within it. So we have that duration of the storm event, we have that depth of the storm event, we dropped it in our model and said, all right, what is this telling us? Th these are the results, These co this color ramp, same color ramp you saw before, of how the water would progress through Tucson. And, and so if we look at a couple comparison points, um, the inundation limits up here in the campground is about there, which is right there, right at that wet line. Right here, same kind of thing. We were able to come through, come through, look at the drone data, look at depths that we measured against buildings and various points even further up in the watershed, say, does, does the modeling make sense or does it not? Looking a little further, we got elevation lines on McDonald's on the back side and the other side. We have inundation limits in the parking lots and up against buildings. Um, and, and then when we look down here at Long Jim Loop where it crosses Coconino Wash by the sewer treatment plant, we have our inundation limits of that water about where it flowed and we're able to look and, and see what that, how that relates to our modeling. So we're able to say, okay, in Tucson, it looks pretty close. Down here at the treatment plant, I think, I think we're modeling maybe, the, the model is showing it maybe a little bit wider than, than it actually happened. So maybe this is just a touch over approximated, and that could be due to several factors, the volume of the storm, things like that. Another, another point of comparison is up at, up at 10x. This, is, this black line is just me going for a run and marking out about where I see inundation limits um, based on what I see in the, see in the grasses and how that relates to our modeling. So in a lot of places, it's, it's quite close. Um, in some areas, it's a little bit off. In some areas, it's just kind of hard to tell um, with, with how deep, deep the water would have been. But, but what, in my mind, what it was doing is at certain points, when I look at um, the width of the water and how deep the water appeared, it fairly closely matched what our model was showing. So what does this tell us? This tells us that with the actual rainfall, the model approximates about 2200 CFS in Tucson. Remember that that's variable. Based on, based on the radar data, it's just it's radar data, we gotta understand that. And with our, we did a sensitivity down analysis, taking that flow up and down to see if less water or more water would actually um, mimic the flood extents better. And what we, what we came up with is, you know, through Tucson, 2000 to about 2500 CFS per the model data, look to be about what happened. 
and probably less than 1,500 at the sanitary district. So for hydrology, that's pretty good. Um, pretty close between what the model is saying to what actually happened in the field. So it tells us that hydrologically, the soil parameters are reasonable. It also tells us that the modeled flow patterns are reasonable. And with those two pieces of data, has to lead me to assume that our 100-year flow rates are most likely reasonable if you have that rainfall over the whole watershed. One point to consider also is that as we go on, we're going to talk about some next steps. Refined, refined hydrology, we may want to consider um, reducing the rainfall depth in the watershed based on the, based on the watershed size. Because generally speaking, you don't have a, a rainfall event that fully covers an entire 60 square mile watershed. And so there's, there's some ways, some methods you can go about adjusting your rainfall depth to account for that. That may make a little bit of, a little bit of difference in the flow rates, but um, not terribly significant. We don't know what those are yet. So one more point of comparison before we move on here. Circle back to our FEMA mapping. This is what people want to assume the flood risk is in town. And let's look what, that's these dark blue lines with the shade. This is the FEMA 100 year flood zone. This is the modeled 100 year flood limits. If we move on to a more easy comparison, even for an event such as you saw, 2200 CFS, 2000 CFS, these are the inundation limits, right? And that's your FEMA floodplain. So it's obviously inaccurate. So next steps. I'm looking ahead. I'll give it back to Lucinda. So before we move to that, though, anybody have any questions about you know, the analysis and the information before we move on to what do we do now with this information? Any questions for Joe? Uh, is the state-of-the-art technology so you're taking that uh, 1980s I'll say in today's world very very un again we've done this in all the post right it's it's almost here and now and Put some perspective on 10,000 feet. Who's been to Lee's Ferry in a normal summer? That's 10,000 CFS. Questions? Yeah, Pete. So <coughs> you had. You know, we're recording this so that people who couldn't come can listen to the recording later. Um, oh, okay. Sorry. Um, Pete Shear, Tucson Sanitary District. Um, I want to thank Joe for uh, his lots of time that he spent on the phone with me, bringing the sanitary district up to speed on a PowerPoint presentation. You mentioned at 10X the fingers that go down towards rain tank wash. Mm -hmm. And we know that about 40 years ago, they raised 302 and it diverts the water into Tucson. We walked that and there was very little um, logs and debris, only about 100 yards into that wash. That could have held up to 40 million gallons of water that would not have come into Tucson. Did you observe any major ponding there from this flood event since you you walked it if it was a free flow like it used to be because it's six feet lower than the road it should have filled up before that water was diverted into Tucson and also um, I'd like to mention that um, back in the 50 years ago I used to work on cleaning out dirt tanks and building dirt tanks and Clorinda's the mayor's father and grandfather Joe Babbitt and people of that understood 
the flooding in Tusian created detention basins, which they call cattle tanks or dirt tanks. And those have not been cleaned out for 30 years, to my knowledge. Reed tank was another catchment, and it's been filled in 50% less than it used to have. So all these things combined, uh, the sanitary district at, is at most is most at risk of flooding. So we have a very serious concern that nothing is getting done in the planning stages to create a solution. So what are the solutions? And uh, did you see any significant ponding in that uh, natural depression? So I guess to the to that question to start, you know, you can see debris against, you could see that water was flowing towards that low point, right? I, I, I suspicion that the, the water flowed into there and it never, what didn't flow at long enough, a long enough time period to actually back up the whole area and flow back out. So we didn't do any modeling like with or without the 302 road, Pete, but um, you know, I think, I think you know, that's something that could be investigated with this whole next planning stage um, that, that we'll get into. Yeah. Yes, Bob, Bob will catch that too, Grand Sanitary as well. Um, I just wanted a clarification question. I, and I know I met with you by Zoom recently. I just wanted to just ensure I have this. So to achieve the 10,500 uh, CFS into the eastern part of Tucson, that would mean we'd have to have basically, on average, a 100-year bend over the 60 miles. Yeah. Okay. That's correct. Any other questions? Any other questions for Joe before we, on the technical piece? From what we understand, about 55 million gallons came through Tucson. This natural basin would have held about 40 million. So if we add another 120 acre feet or about another 30 million of storage, that would have stopped significant, uh, per perhaps all of the floodwaters that came into Tucson. Uh, we have two detention basins in Tucson. One is called McDonald's parking lot. The other is below Ca Canyon Pines and uh, the holiday housing that big um, be created by the road that was probably put in 80 or 100 years ago. And so we had 2,200 to approximately coming in, but we only had 1,500 at the sanitary district. So that means those two detention basins reduce the flow by one third. So are, is there any work or any um, forward movement in establishing more detention basins and specifically to um, finish what has been approved with Lucinda and my work, um, what, 11, 12 years ago, we got a grant and we figured out that we could stop a significant amount of water by creating detention basins. And the Forest Service is on board with that, but no work has been done because of politics and bureaucracy in 10 years. And the Forest Service seems to be a willing partner in helping to create a solution to this. And so we need to move forward. We need to get this, all the stakeholders together and not just study this and do more um, engineering. We need to actually have work on the ground to solve this problem. Uh, the town has appropriated a million and a half one year, I think two million another year, but nothing has ever got done. So these detention basins are made to be just the first step. They're not the final, they're just to get us started. And we know that we'll need more massive um, solutions. I'll let Joe address the small scale detention that Pete's referring to, but just wanna make it clear, no funding has ever been allocated to Tucson. We have had no funding. <laughs> so no, no historic funding's ever been, you know, we, there was some preliminary work done, been a lot of, a lot of, you know, 
lack of a better term, I'll say there's been some changes over time. We're now working very closely with the council and I think are now positioned to move forward. That wasn't the case several years ago. You know that, Pete. And so, you know, I think we're in a position now to move forward. I think we've got very good science. Unfortunately, things don't happen overnight. Even when you're in the midst of a disaster, like we are outside of Flagstaff and the flood areas, our, things don't happen overnight. And so it's going to take a process. And, you know, if you, if you run out, the district cannot put people at risk. These are public safety projects. Every project that we engineer and we construct goes through what's called no adverse impact. And that's very, very important to understand that we have to prove scientifically with national using national standards that we won't create anything that's worse than what it is now to any, any individual property within this area. So you all have that commitment that as we work through this, we're using good science, we're using engineering, we're not just running out and doing things here and there, hoping that it'll work. It's got to work. It's got to prove that it's going to work through the analysis because obviously there's a tremendous amount of liability as well, not only for the district, but for parties who might participate with us, like the Forest Service or other private property owners as well. And so who, have to, who will likely have to provide drainage easements. So everybody's counting on the ability to do this work and not create adverse impacts, not create threats to other people in this process so that's critical I'll, I'll let joe t speak to the smaller scale detention yeah and you know i think the i think the thing to keep in mind is that and this is where we're going with this <clears throat> is we're starting on that th this is a starting point for for understanding for refining that hydrology ref revising the fema maps and planning for what's most effective all these are different pieces puzzle pieces that have to come together they have to fit well together. So if if it makes sense to do a forest basin over doing something else, then that that needs to be vetted, right? And so that um, that's an aspect that that really needs to be dug into in these next phases moving forward. And um, and so to that point, that that's got to be all the stakeholders involved. There's a lot of different aspects to that that really needs to start coming together now. And that kind of plays into where you're going now. Great, thanks Joe. Thank you for covering that. I think it's, <clears throat> you know, it's really important that people understand the science and, you know, I'll say going back even prior to Schultz, but particularly since the Schultz, we've really understood that in, and the board, thankfully, has stayed very committed to the science and to using rigorous science and rigorous engineering and it's paid off. We've had tremendous success Mitigate, mitigating post wildfire and two projects we have done have been very successful. So what we're looking at is going down the road here is, is two tracks. There's a regulatory track that really influences working with directly with FEMA to remap the formal floodplain, the special flood hazard area in Tucson to reflect the actual risk now that's been modeled. And, and we're, we'll talk through that a little bit here. Then the second track is a planning track. And that planning track is really all around, is really centered on, in, a, in an area like this with this much, both existing development, potential proposed development, proposed and potential development, as well of the magnitude of this watershed, developing a true drainage master plan is really the, has to be the next step. Because you, you, it, as you said, there are a set of pieces that will be put into place that have to function together. And if you don't look at the whole, you're, you're not gonna create. And we've been working, I should have also introduced Jack Moody who serves as the city engineer Fortunately, Jack's got a really strong background in, in hydrology, been working really closely with Joe. And I think that's, you know, that, that, that is, we've all agreed, the key is to put a plan together that's comprehensive, that isn't piecemeal, it's comprehensive, 
because once you start spending dollars, these are big dollars. These are little dollars. You can go spend a little bit of dollars right now, you probably get, a, and you're going to get a little bit of benefit, maybe a little bit of benefit. May help you in a one year storm, two year storm, three year storm, that's it. If you want real benefit, we may never be able to get to 100 year. We might be able to not afford that, to be honest. And there may not be the cost benefit. We've got to prove cost benefit on everything. So to get the grant money through FEMA to do these projects. So um, it's, a, it's a big process. Um, so on the regulatory track, the next steps the, the board has supported moving forward to submit the required document documents and study information to FEMA. It's going to take Joe and his team probably about nine months to get that completed and get that submitted to FEMA. In the interim, if there are entities that are proposing development, much like we did with the McDonald's here as an example, John Carr works with those individuals, as does Joe and myself, and we're providing the best available information, which are the results of that study. Um, we can't regulate to that yet, technically, but what we historically have always found is that people realize it's in their best interest to, to adhere to this because ultimately that's where we're headed, right? Um, so our intent is to submit this documentation to FEMA. We would expect that process to take up to two to four years. It could take a lot longer. We'll put a lot of pressure on them, try to keep that moving to actually get the formal legal, you know, floodplain mapping uh, updated. In the interim, we're going to establish an administrative floodplain that we do have some capacity to, to regulate to, and uh, which will probably take about four or four to five months to get that, that documentation done, get it through the board, and move through that process. Obviously, this all has to be approved by the board. Um, but certainly, if I mean, we, we've had a call just in the last week. <laughs> about people considering development here. And if anybody's considering development, um, these are the kinds of conversations we're having. Jack's in those conversations. Uh, and we work very closely together um, on that. Then the second track is the planning track. And this really gets to what Pete's bringing up is how do we move forward? Um, and fortunately, we have the hydrology. We have a lot of the hydraulics done. That major component is done. Now we can start moving to look at what are the opportunities for mitigation? What does that look like? And, and where and where are the soils? I mean, there's a lot of detail that goes into that to come up with initially a conceptual plan. And then you start working through. You prioritize what projects. You prioritize your timeline and how you're going to move through those efforts. Um, to to uh, to develop those projects. What partnerships do you need? If you're on forest, you got to go through the National Environmental Policy Act process. Um, we're very good and very we we've, we've learned through our processes how to work through these processes, you know. But it takes time. I mean, there is time involved. Um, so you go through, that will involve a lot of, probably all of you in this room, be a lot of discussion with the community about what to prioritize the funding that's needed, et cetera. All that discussion has to take place. So what's involved in securing the funding for developing the master drainage, drainage master plan? So right now, the flood control district, Casey, that's with us and uh, that I introduced earlier, we're looking at two potential grants through FEMA. Um, one is the it's called BRIC, the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities, and then the second grant program is Flood Mitigation Assistance, and uh, the period to submit for those grants right now, and this would be grants that we're submitting to get the drainage master plan. You can't you can't successfully complete nationally for those project dollars unless you've got a sophisticated, well-developed drainage master plan. That doesn't happen. We've tried a, we tried a couple times some one-offs. Didn't work. Not going anywhere. 
So, um, so we need to get that, we need to get the money, get the good plan in place, and then we start moving through that process. Right now, the flood control district, we've already borrowed 15 million from the county to do the flood mitigation, and um, we have no funding to do this work. So that's part of what we've got to work through is figure out where will the first set of funding come from to pay for the drainage master plan and working with the town as well. Uh, where is that money? But the grant funding is going to be really critical for that and for the ongoing projects. So, I mean, our hope again is we can break this cycle on the post wildfire flooding and we can start putting more money into exactly these kinds of projects. And that'll be a part of this conversation. I mentioned that we've got this four to five month series of uh, uh, presentations to the board. That will be part of that conversation is break how important it is to break this cycle so we can start f investing in our special flood hazard areas. And, and, you know, and it'll be up to the board to decide what the prioritization of those projects. But I can tell you based on risk, Tucson's very high, in that, very high in that list. So this is just a little bit of background on these on these projects. I, I think we have the opportunity to be pretty competitive here given how Tucson is situated, uh, the impact that Tucson contributes to the statewide economy. Um, I think we have an opportunity to be competitive, um, but it, it, it still takes some, some real effort. Um, but you can see what are some of the kinds of things that they fund and are interested in supporting. Uh, obviously, we fall into national, natural hazard risk reduction activities, right? Um, but we'll look at some nature-based pieces to this too. There could be some watershed restoration and other things that we look at. And then the, fee, the FMA grant, um, this shows you some of the other things. We'll be applying under the capacity and capability building. That's planning, you know, getting draining master plans done. Again, if you don't have that first step done and you don't have a sophisticated plan, it's not worth uh, any time to put any effort into applying. It's very competitive. And then in addition to that, the town, I'll turn it over to Charlie, is, is pursuing a grant uh, related to Highway 64. Thanks, Lucinda. Um, I just want to back up a minute to kind of go back to something you guys said earlier. And I shared this with Joe when we met with them earlier, but it'll try to do it without the emotion this time. But um, about, I've actually been here going on four years now. I can't believe how fast it goes. But um, one of my first meetings when I came was to meet with Joe, and I didn't treat him super nice in that meeting because he presented similar information and I thought it was just a bunch of buck um, and I shared that with him in less than polite terms um, and mayors kind of rounded out some of my edges since then but but I, w I wasn't very polite to him and and you needless to say we didn't talk for a while after that but um, but I really had to apologize to him um, when I saw him again recently because he stuck to his guns on that information and they required mcdonald's to build to those numbers and um and because of it you know on the day of the flood there were there were people in those in that building they were constructing it and there were people in there and those people were safe and they just right rode out the flood in the building and um and that's a reminder to me that at the end of the day everything that we're doing is to protect people and to protect people's lives. And it's also a reminder to me that the work that we're doing here has to be collaborative. And I'm gonna go back in a second and talk about what's led to this grant. But one of the things I've learned is we've built great relationships internally with our internal partners, with the sanitary district and the fire district. And that's gotten us a long, long ways. We've had more in grants in the last few years than the town's ever had. But we've come up to some walls and I've realized it's because we haven't had the full partnership of the county. 
and we haven't had the full partnership of the Forest Service, and we haven't had the full partnership of ADOT. And in order to solve this problem, we have to have those partners at the table. And sometimes those partners are not going to tell us everything we want to hear, but we have to hear those things, and we have to be able to talk it out and get to those issues, because without their help, we're not going to solve these problems. And that takes me to the beginnings of this grant. About a year ago, we approached the Tucson Sanitary District and the Tucson Fire District about a grant opportunity for flood planning. And Pete told us some things we didn't want to hear, but we worked together and we got those grants submitted. And we did not get those grants. Um, and we submitted a congressional spending request that we got through two rounds of, and then in the last round, we did not get it. But the thing that was important about those grants is that when the flooding occurred, those people remembered us and actually called us and said, we have never seen a time when within six months of application, the thing you said would happen actually happened. And so they've been working with us silently behind the scenes to find and identify grant applications and a pathway so that we can get those monies. And the most viable one that we've identified is the Arizona Smart Fund grant. And we've been really blessed because with Lucinda and her team's expertise, we've been able to put together an application package. We have a draft. Um, Jack and I are putting it to working on it. It needs some real overhaul. Um, I'm hoping that Lucinda will take a look at it. And we hope that we'll have it together either before the end of the year or right after the beginning of the year. Um, I want to tell you just a little bit about it. Um, the concept, and we're going to put in for the whole enchilada. We don't know. Obviously, you don't usually get the whole thing. But the concept is to take us through the three steps from where we are today to where we'll be ready. It won't take us through construction or mitigation, but it will get us up to that point where we can then apply for a construction grant. Um, but the three steps are, like uh, Lucinda said, is to do the comprehensive drainage master plan, the design concept report, and construction documents. And the goal is to do Highway 64, and we have approval to put in for work on Long Jim Loop and RP Drive as well, because they were not only because they were flood impacted, but because they are the only viable alternative route to Highway 64 in town. I don't know that we'll get approval for that, but we have approval to put in for it. So we're going to put in for those. Um, the important thing, um, I know there's been some question about how do we make sure that we protect our critical infrastructure like the sanitary district. And I would encourage you to talk to Jack because um, he and I have talked and he can point to exactly in the process where that analysis will be done. I don't want to keep you all here any longer, but outside the meeting, he can talk to you very specifically um, about what Lucinda said earlier, the, um, the uh, thank you, the no adverse impact. I'm not an engineer yet, sorry guys. Um, but I just, I just want to add my kind of thanks to everybody to the end of this. Um, obviously the mayor and council have led us through this and are leading us through it, but the real answer in all of this is really going to be collaboration. We are going to have to have tough conversations. Pete and I have tough conversations every day, and I love them because they make me think. They make me think about what's best for the town. We're going to have to keep having those conversations, and we need everybody on board because this is... This requires everybody to be present. So. Thank you, Charlie. I uh, couldn't agree more. Um, I think that rounds out if there's any other questions or yes, ma'am.
the the regulatory track well they've all started the the refine the re hydrology that's underway already joe's starting to work on that we got direction from the board that we can work on that move that forward um, the planning track same thing casey's been in working really closely with fema D that comes through the state fema Department of Emergency Management at the state level on getting the applications prepared both for BRIC and FMA. So that one is due, I think the date's like around the end of February, no later than the end of February. And then, uh, you know, I don't know, Casey, when do they, do they do give you any kind of idea when they'll tell us whether we were successful or not? Is it like, usually it's at least four to six months before they tell you. Yeah. So, it is this on? I don't know if you guys can hear me or not. Uh, yeah, the the application will go to DMA at the beginning of February. FEMA reviews at the end, and there's pretty decent process six to nine months for review of award or not, and then there's another time frame after that for actually receiving the funds. Is it if I can? Sure. So you asked the very same question when it came to the board, you need to know. These timelines are ridiculous. It is unfortunately a federal process and we need to get the FEMA mat changed. So, you know, it, it seems to be laboriously long. Uh, in the meantime, however, we do need to look at an administrative flood plain so that we have some regulatory control while we're waiting for FEMA to come in and complete this mapping project. So, you know, I was pushing for, you know, I was pushing this guy right here saying, how fast, how fast, how fast? And he's going to do it as fast as he can to get this done. This is important. We move this forward. Not, not, not today. You know, really, quite frankly, some of the modeling, everything started before the flood. It was amazing. I mean, quite frankly, uh, we had met with the, with the mayor and the town manager and quite frankly, members of the council and, and we showed the modeling and then what, three, three months, four months later, uh, we end up having a, a, a flood that absolutely modeled the modeling that was done. It showed the modeling that was done. So we're on the, we're on the path, but we're going to try to get this done as quickly and po as possible. But we really do, and I know that, that we've talked with the mayor, we do need to do an administrative floodplain. Yes, sir. I just want to thank everybody for their, I'm Greg from Tucson Fire District. I want to thank everybody for their efforts. I just wanted to make sure that everybody knows, especially Joe, that we had an event a year to the week before this event it almost touched town, stopped just shy. And I really wanted to echo what Pete had said about the, the value of detention basins or whatever you want to call them, mm -hmm. as far as that averted that disaster then. We had a burn event that led up to that, as we're all aware of how that affects things. But that burn event was in the watershed. And that storm that we had a year prior to this was centered right over that. So just wanted to make sure that was part of the, the history and the data. Okay. That's all. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I, I would be pretty surprised if detention isn't, you know, a major element of how we move forward. The, the big question, frankly, with that, that we have to be able to answer before we apply for those dollars is how are we going to maintain it? And that's a huge cost. So, um, you know, detention doesn't come with no cost. We've been very fortunate with what we've done in the Schultz area, we've done very little detention. We've done mostly watershed restoration, which has been almost uh, maintenance free. And a lot of the infrastructure even that we've done has been maintenance free um, because of the watershed restoration. Unfortunately here, it's a very different dynamic and there's just a whole lot of water. And as everyone saw, did you, you could see how, even with a very fairly minor fire, and that, you know, how much sediment came in to the community debris. And so part of that, we'll be looking at that watershed and how do we get that cleaned up to get some of that dead and down and other things, not only to make the, you know, less lower the risk of fire, but also lower the risk of that debris coming into town, plugging up your, you know, your, your culverts, your boxes. 
because it's all got a function when it happens. And that's hard to maintain. It takes a lot of, a lot of resources. Um, what was the cleanup? What, what did the cleanup look like after the flood? Because we had all that water surrounding the road and the and empty lot underneath the McDonald's. What ended up happening with the cleanup there? Oh, I'm Derek Cook. I'm the franchise operator for McDonald's. Well, I know we, the County Public Works provided some level of support with some of the cleanup of the roads. Um, I, others may be able to speak to that. Yeah, I was going to say the fire district, um, the county helped, um, ADOT helped mainly in clearing the road. The rest of it, the water just sat there for quite some time and, and, and infiltrated. The, there's some cleanup going on in the landscaping and stuff right now. Um, a lot of it, a lot of the more debris, I think that you're kind of speaking of, wound up way back in the valley. A lot of the floating dumpsters and all those kinds of things kind of really round, wound up in the valley. So like the lot that you're talking about, nothing's been done to that lot at all since the flood. So then we just have our just basic routine, everyone that's part of our utilities and safety. They helped clean up and kind of volunteered for that. We didn't have to hire an outside company to come and help or clean anyway, hire tractors or anything like that, right? Um, the county did back on, on um, Long Jim Loop. The county did and we had some... Um, I don't remember 25 loads or 30 loads or something of material that had to be brought to stabilize that road. So that was a, a, a county. There was, and then a lot of individual businesses had, you know, did their own cleanup, like the Holiday Inn housing and you guys and the Squire, and the Squire had insurance. And, and what was the, what were those ones? Oh yeah, the street sweeper, some things like that. But a lot of volunteer equipment and sanitary district and Tucson fire and even my own tractor did a lot of that cleanup around around town and an RP drive and whatever. And sanitary district a lot as well. I I I would say that I'm I, we drove around before we came here and I'm pretty impressed with what a great job everybody's done cleaning up i'm really impressed it's not you know i mean we're dealing with post wildfire flooding we spent nine million dollars dealing with short-term mitigation and cleanup in just one summer of 2022 and it adds up really really quickly when you have those you know repetitive events like you do there but for an event like this to happen and it looks in pretty good shape i'm i'm really surprised know that you don't you don't hit a threshold with FEMA. People think, oh, yeah, an event like this, FEMA rushes in and they have money and people and all that. that that's not what happens. <laughs> Even when we have the big events, it, it doesn't happen. You have to be at, I think now we're our thresholds at around 12 or 13 million minimally to get support for dealing with public infrastructure solely. And it you have to invest the money and you don't, well, first you have to go through a rigorous process to get approved and then you invest the money and then you don't see any money for three to four years so that's why the mitigation is so important because going through an episode like that is you know um, we have other funding sources fortunately we've gotten access to for what we're dealing with post wildfire but um, that's why it's so important that we find the funding to get the mitigation done yes you had a uh, <clears throat> my name's Steve Harris I'm actually with the uh, uh, flood barrier manufacturer, Flood Break, that had the barriers installed in the uh, McDonald's. And uh, a couple of quick points. One is just a compliment to the, the franchise and the construction company that's done the work. That's going to be a world-class building from a flood perspective once it's completed. Uh, also, it's a compliment to the, uh, I think, the permitting process, even though sometimes people don't like to hear the the news, I, I think it's really outstanding. Second thing I wanted to do is I wanted to compliment Joe and his presentation um, for explaining what is extremely complex in the whole hydrology mapping. I've sat in on 10 years of presentations and things, and this was the best I've ever heard. 
The th third is, in the last six months, I've set in on uh, uh, four, four different floodplain conferences, one in LA for California and Arizona, one in uh, Spokane for the Northern FMA group, and one up in Vancouver. And uh, Flagstaff and Coconino County has made it uh, every presentation as an example of really good work of uh, flooding at flood after fire. So compliments to the work that you're doing Thank and you. keep it up. Thank you. you. Got very visible. Uh, yeah, we've been through it. Yeah, and you should use that though for your grants. Well, we will. I mean, <laughs> and, and yeah, I mean, it, it does really help because we have experience working with the federal agencies and we know what resources they need to be supported. We know what are realistic, what's realistic. Um, I mean, we have a tremendous partnership now with the Forest Service and, you know, we had the fire on pipeline boom. I mean, they got the, the NEPA done in less than nine months, but we provided the archeologists to do, to actually go out and do the boots on the ground. I mean, you have to know, everybody has to put in the pieces to make the puzzle work, right? And that's what it's gonna take. Uh, it's gonna take a lot of pieces. So, but we need to be very strategic about our investments and how we do what we need to do so that we can get it done. And that's what it takes. Other comments, questions? Yes, sir. And I wanna apologize in advance for uh, you know regurgitating this. Um, the sanitary districts, you know, very enthusiastic about any measures of slowing down the water as it makes its way to the sanitary district. As Joe said, it was about 1500 CFS over at the sanitary district on that day. However, on the east side of town, it came in at a much greater rate. Now, Pete alluded to the happen chance detention basins that are already in place, meaning McDonald's area, you know, that whole area and the area between the sanitary district and town, they, they made basically, you know, although there is, they held a lot of water. Uh, had all that water came to the sanitary district, we would have been in real trouble, I think. Um, we have an optimistic estimate of about 2,400 CFS. Uh, Your channel can manage. For that channel. Yeah. Now, just keep in mind, every drop of water that comes through Tucson has to go through that location. So whatever happens upstream of us, we're very concerned with. And so like the detention basins, anything that slows water down, we're real happy. And that, now, I know Charlie and the town have uh, put in, you know, they're working on a new uh, grant that would, you know, include w making the culverts, you know, over the highway much larger, which would be great. However, <laughs> that would be detrimental Just shifts to the us. problem, yes. Right, when you talk about no adverse That's effect, why there you know, has to be a comprehensive plan. Right. That's why there has to be a drainage master plan. Right, so that's when you mentioned no adverse offense, uh, effects to people right. downstream or, or even upstream, right? Correct. But... Uh, you know, I, in just been, I'm a, almost a 30 year resident here and I've seen that not always happen. You know, ADOT came through and they did a, you know, the improvement and they upgraded some channels. Based on the old and it plan, changed the old map. That no one knew seen coming, you know, because they put mm -hmm. channels in. And so we want her to get the grant and we just don't want shovels in the dirt until we've, you know, absolutely. Yep. And I want to put everybody's you know, radar, you know, that the sanitary district, that's where the buck stops right there. Everything has to be contingent on that. So, if, if I just want to add to that, Bob, that it has to touch Highway 64 for us to get this grant. Nobody is saying that automatically means until this plan is done, what is going to come from it. I just, that's a misconception that that means they're for sure going to be increasing them. It touches Highway 64, that's why we get to apply for the grant. The plan will come up with what exactly would happen. It's not an automatic, because we know what that problem could create if the, we just made the culverts bigger. We know. Thanks, Corinne. And, I, and I, I, that's where I pretty much, I had a pretty lengthy discussion with Charlie on that, and she, you know, she's with the understanding. I just kind of want to ensure that er, that's everybody's understanding because nothing should happen until you've taken the sanitary district into account. And if the sanitary district's right. 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 Well, I know you say it's a fact, but we've seen other things happen in the past that wasn't, it wasn't considered. Yeah. 
Understand playing this straight, right? We're not helping you put him at risk. Then they're not going to sign drainage easements because we need drainage easements to get all this work done, you know. Or, or we need an easement for we need permission from her service, right? They need to see how it's going to balance and they say, well, yes, yes, you can move forward. It just to be clear, Bob, and I know you know this, but just for everyone else in the room who may not, the grant, and I, I have to always look at the talking points because Jack helps me with the technical language. The grant is for three things, for the comprehensive drainage master plan, the design concept report, and the construction documents. Until it's in the comprehensive drainage master plan, that those things will be determined. So there's no plan right now for culverts. There's no plan for basins. There's no plan for any of those things. It's in that plan process that those things will be flushed out. I think what we're saying is that everything's on the table. Everything will be considered. Everything will be evaluated. But what we do know is that none of those things can have an adverse impact. Did I say that, Pete? So um, first, I'd like to apologize too for being a little harsh and overzealous on this. Um, we've worked well, together hey, for years. You've earned it, years. Pete. <laughs> John and Christopher, Carl Taylor, a lot of folks have worked over this. Ted Smith, before we were incorporated, we've been working on this because if the sanitary district is overrun, it shuts down everything That's in right. PCM. It shuts right. down the airport, the airport housing, every business, yep. every residence, including the forest compound. And so we take it very seriously. So then touching on the funding that you said the county has never committed any funding, that's true, but the town had it in, I think it was in 13, 14, and uh, 14 and 15, they had appropriated in their budget, they had one and a half and two million dollars to do this first project that has been approved. All the archaeological is done. The um, all the NEPA stuff is done. The um, the biggest issue was who is going to maintain these detention basins. Right. We have yes. committed because we have such a large stake in this. The sanitary district has committed to cleaning out these and maintaining these detention basins in doing the semi-annual inspections and hauling away the silt that goes in. So all that is in place and realizing it's only going to stop, this first project is only going to stop about 10 million gallons of floodwaters. But we all realized when we got permission from the Forest Service to move forward with the plans that this was a first step. And it was a place to start building a more comprehensive plan. So as you work on your master plan, your uh, master drainage study, and with all these other things, we should start to do this project that has already been approved. And if we can get funding from the town or if the sanitary district can help, um, they rent the equipment, we can do this project. If we just need to get the 30% plans resubmitted that I think it was April 4th, we had a meeting and the Forest Service is asking me, why haven't you come back and proceeded with submitting this so we can review it? Because we realize Tucson is at a very serious flood risk and they would like to help any well, way they can. They're not committing to um, any specific plan of action, but they would review whatever the town and the flood district comes up with. The biggest problem here, I've talked to everybody for probably 10 hours last week, I spent on the phone. The flood district says that they cannot move forward. They're waiting for the town to create a plan to move forward. The town, because of the adversarial um, past history that we have, 
is waiting for the flood district to take the lead. So we need the flood district, the town, the Forest Service, and the sanitary district to sit down and actually make something happen so we can not have so, the fire. So let me respond, flood. Pete. Okay. We, the, the, the so let, let me respond. So I appreciate your plan. And it sounds like a lot of water people, it's a drop in the bucket. I think, you know, we've reviewed it before. We know it will only manage extremely small events. And so it's, but it still has to be looked at in a comprehensive fashion as was pointed out. And so, I know certainly we can look at it again and we're happy to do that. I also want to understand this detention that's referred to in town. Is it truly detention? <laughs> you know, is it is it deemed as such? Is it planned? Is it maintained? Is it you know? I think we say things like, "Well, there's detention at McDonald's." Well, I need to better understand what that looks. There's detention behind the road. That was never created for that purpose, I don't think. So we need to get down to brass tacks, folks, and. Um, you know, it, I'll tell you, I think the reality is with the, the magnitude of this issue, we're far better off. First and foremost, I hope the number one thing that the sanitary district can do is start pressing ADEQ for money. Start You, you can start pressing for grants to, to help with this whole effort. First and foremost, get some money to help match the grants for the stuff to get the drainage master plan done. That's step one, get that done. I mean, you can, if you wanna to piece together, but a million to two million, I mean, you know, that could be a significant component of a future, more, much more major effort if we can get the drainage master plan in place. So, um, you know, I appreciate people wanna go out and see boots on the ground right away. If Joe can attest. I. I press people every week about getting boots on the ground. At the same time, um, I, w I wish those little bit, those little tiny basins would have more of an impact, but they won't. And then what we've done is we've created a false sense of security in this community. And then, then when we get the next big rain event, people are gonna come and say, dang mayor, and they won't say dang, they'll say something else, but they'll say dang mayor, dang supervisor, dang flood administrator, why the heck didn't this work? You spent $2 million and we didn't get a damn thing out of it. And we've been, you know, and that we don't want to have those kind of setbacks. We need everybody on board to support this because we're going to need letters to Congress, our Cong congressional representatives, we're going to need to get senators up here. We're going to need to do all the legwork to get the money and get this stuff done. It's a, it's a big road. So let's take one more question, then we'll let people move on. It's warm in here. Yes, sir. Speaking of brass tacks, uh, does, is, does in critical infrastructure still have to be built to a 500-year floodplain event? I, John, do you know the answer to that? I don't know that that's typically, I think it's still 100, but... still the case I'm curious with the professionals we have in here if that's still the case if anyone knows the answer to that question is what would that look like for the sanitary district and the fire district being critical infrastructure thank you and that'll have to be looked at I mean critical infrastructure is a key component of the drainage master plan and the sanitary district is the core I mean I there's no disagreement Pete knows there's no disagreement hmm? Yeah, it is. It is. I'm not sure. Well, thank you. I really, really appreciate. Do, does anybody? So, yeah, I guess one one quick point on that. I, I got to check on that with the sanitary district. We didn't, but we didn't analyze the 500 year. So, that, I think that part can all be in, in that first part of the planning so. Yeah. I was on the board. Right. Yeah, we'd have to check on that with the sanitary. I've, ne I've never heard that. Uh, 
Typically, it's a hundred year. Is it, but I don't, Jack. Yeah, I do know that it was a um, executive order. Um, so uh, Jack Rooney, the uh, interim town engineer. Uh, the what you're talking about was an executive order that took place uh, several years ago. Uh, had to design several uh, critical infrastructure pieces to that. Um, I do not know. I know that that executive order came under um, a, a, a litigation, and I honestly I don't know the outcome of that litigation. Yeah, I haven't seen anything come through. John would see that regularly too. If something formal came through, rel relative to that, so existing facilities, though, I think it would have. Yeah, to it wouldn't affect if they were to expand the plant. Then right, that exactly. would come into play, not the existing. Yeah, potentially. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody. Again, really, really appreciate. It. Great questions. Great comments. You know. Um, hang in there with us. I know this is challenging, and uh, but people care. Mayor cares. We care, and we want to work with you to keep moving it forward. We'll get there. Thank you.